I'm here from Brno, and I lead an adaptive learning research group, which uh, develops system for learning, mainly for kids at elementary and high schools, and we try to develop the system so that they are in some way intelligent, adaptive, personalized, and we do research relevant to these topics. Since I assume that most of you do not work in educational field, I have decided to try to focus my presentation on machine learning stuff that's related to our research. And I have tried to select topics which are applicable beyond education. So even for those of you who have nothing to do with education, I hope that you can have some insights or ideas from my talk. I will start with some specific examples of systems that we developed to give you an idea of what we are working on, and then I will move on to, to the research part. So here, a quick quiz at the beginning. What's the meaning of colors in this diagram? The green, red colors. Try to guess. This is visualization of data from one of our first major projects, which was focused on practice of geography. <laughs> and this is a visualization of collected data of difficulties of countries for our students, for Czech students. So the green countries are the ones which Czech students know well, and the red ones are the ones that they mostly do not know. And so the focus in the system it was a simple practice of names and locations of countries, and the focus was on giving an appropriate questions to students. So for example, if somebody is struggling even with European countries, it's no point asking him about these small African countries. On the other hand, if somebody is quite good, even with some of these uh, African countries, then it's no point asking him about Australia or Russia because he will cer certainly know. Similarly, we have uh, similar systems in other domains. For example, this is um, uh, anatomy practice for medical students, which works in similar fashion to the geography one. Here's some practice of uh, animals. Here, for example, uh, an interesting question, kind of also a research question is, how to construct distractors in such a multiple choice questions? So let's say this, this is the correct answer, this animal. We want the distractors, the wrong answers, to be competitive. They should be kind of similar to the right answer, but they should be, not be too confusing. And how do we construct this? At the moment, we are experimenting with some multi-arm bandits for this problem. Then some practice of elementary math for kids, uh, Czech grammar, English grammar. Here, this is a, from one of our current projects. The focus here is on this progress bar on the top. We are using some kind of master learning. The basic behavior is simple. If you answer correctly, the progress bar go ups, goes up. If you make a mistake, the progress bar goes down. So that's a simple, but the specific setting of the algorithm for the progress bar and of the parameters is quite tricky. It should go up and down after the correct and correct answer, but how much it should go up? How many questions should it take to reach the mastery? That's kind of tricky. It's kind of hard to say because uh, even the methodology how to set the parameters is not clear. We do not have, we cannot we don't see into heads of the students. We don't know when they really understand the topic. We have to set it somehow. And currently, we are using some simulations to study the behavior of these algorithms. And then we provide the students some visualization of the knowledge. We have typically uh, hundreds of knowledge components like these, thousands of questions. So we provide students some overview of their skills. We uh, do have practice not just of simple facts, but also, for example, of programming. Uh, we focus typically on introductory programming, either in Python or using some block-based pr programming languages, which are common for introductory programming. So it's some variation of common themes used for introductory programming. Again, our focus is on making it adaptive. So for example, here in this project, uh, we uh, the goal is to get the spaceship to the blue line using some short program constructed from blocks. And when you finish the pro pro problem, we want to give, provide a recommendation with, with of another problem which you should follow with. And the, the recommendation should take uh, into account your performance on the problem. Not just whether you solve the problem, but whether you solve it without any problems, fluently, or whether you struggled with the solution. And again, it's quite tricky to quantify the performance. Uh, let's say that we have your data, we, we observe your time, uh, the number of blocks that you use, the, the, Maybe that you made some mistake and then you corrected yourself, and now we need to per quantify your performance. Was it nearly 100 correct, or was it poor? How should we do this? How, which metric should we use? That's, that are some of the questions that we study. And this is an example of another turtle graphics, another interactive programming problem that we use and study. So these were some ex specific examples of the systems that we develop and some illustrations of the question that we study. 
Before I go into the specific research questions that we that I want to mention today, I have some two high-level points. One is that adaptive learning is difficult. If you hear some claims, particularly in popular press, about some powerful AI techniques that bring personalized learning and that will remove teachers, this is mostly nonsense. The community is moving forward. We have some techniques that work sometimes, but we are far from some general, general adaptive learning applicable in many domains. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Personalization in general is difficult. Even personalized settings like sales recommendations are difficult to do correctly. Learning specifically is more difficult than, for example, personalizing uh, sales because learning is a long-term process which is really hard to measure. Then we have these different types of knowledge. It's something as practicing facts and practicing problem solving like programming. You need different types of techniques, different types of recommendations and so on. And another practical obstacle is integration with current educational practice. Even if you have a good product, it's often difficult to have it used within schools. Another high-level point that I want to make is about the role of machine learning, of analysis of data in the development. I have simplified, uh, simplified it here, our use of machine learning and data into two points, one called artificial intelligence and intelligence, second intelligence amplification. These are I use these terms in a simplified setting, but under the first group, I mean techniques where we use the algorithms to make decisions automatically. The algorithms take data and make some decisions like the choice of questions, which whether we will ask the student about Germany or Poland, and some recommendations whether we will recommend the student to solve fractions or simple addition, or the mastery criteria, the progress bar. Techniques where the algorithms automatically make decisions based on the data. The second group of techniques, which I call here intelligence amplification, is the use where we take the data, we take some algorithm, do the analysis, and the result of the analysis is used by a human to support decisions made by the human, typically by the developer of the system. For example, the decisions about priorities for development, or this can be a feedback for content authors about how the problems work or don't work, uh, developing the domain model in the math, for example, the fractions and so on. Uh, simple examples of such analysis are difficulties of items, just listing sorted difficulties of items in your system. And also in popular press and so on, the artificial intelligence stuff gets most of the attention in my experience, at least in the development of our systems. We, we definitely use these techniques, as I mentioned in the examples, but this step is much more important. The fact that we use machine learning and data analysis to support our decisions, our human decisions, and guide the development is practically much more important than the first step. And I think it's true in many other domains as well. Now I will go to some specific examples of research topics that we cover, and as I said, I try to pick those that I think may be interesting, may, may have some message even beyond education applications. One is student modeling and our use of L rating system originally from chess, then evaluation methodology and some issues and similarity measures. So the first, Topic, student modeling. So many of the uh, adaptive techniques, that, adaptive behaviors that we want to achieve are based on student modeling, which is we want to have uh, some model, some estimate of student knowledge. So let's say that you solve some math problems, you solve some fr fractions example, then some equations, and maybe then some graphs about linear functions. So we have, your, as an input for, um, for the modeling, we have the stream of your data, your answers to the questions, response times, maybe some specific actions, specific textual answers, and so on. And based on this data, we want to estimate your knowledge. We want to estimate your knowledge of fractions and maybe even a, of some other dom aspects of math that you didn't directly solve. Uh, and for the modeling, we use not just your data, but also the data about uh, other student performance. So we, for example, know that some question is really difficult, and if you answer it correctly, then it's, that's probably an indication of your high knowledge. So this is our input stream. We want to model somehow your knowledge, and as an output of the model, we typically have the predictions of future performance. So based on the estimated of your knowledge, we can, the model predicts that if we give you this equation with fractions, there's a 40% chance that you will be able to solve it. Once we have this kind of model, we can use it in many uh, applications for adaptive behavior, like the choice of questions, recommendations. We can use it to give you some feedback, to visualize the progress, uh, even to provide some personalized hints or explanations, and so on, based on the estimate of your knowledge. 
And in the community, there are many, this is a well-studied topic because it's very important for the domain. So there are some Bayesian techniques, even some neural networks are starting to be used for this problem. But in my practice, one approach which is very simple and yet often reasonably powerful is the L rating system, which is uh, originally from a completely different domain, from chess. I guess many of you have heard about it, or at least the fact that uh, chess players have some rating called L rating, which kind of quantifies their, their strength. And the basic system is quite old, and uh, I will not go to, through the details of the math, but the basic system is quite simple, just uh, two or three equations which can be implemented in a few lines of code. And the basic idea of, of the rating system is that uh, the uh, um, when we have a match of two players, two chess players, one strong, one weak, let's say, the update of the L rating is proportional to how surprising the result was. So if I have a strong player and a weak player, and the strong player wins, that's not a surprising result, and the update of, of L rating is only small. If the weak player wins, then it's a surprising result, and the update is higher. If we have two players which are of the similar strength, then again, the result is more informative, and the update is higher. So that's the basic L rating system, uh, which has many extensions, which are like more clever than the basic version, but even the basic one is quite powerful. How is it relevant to our systems? We do not have any players, we have just students answering questions, but we can easily reinterpret this as a match. If we have a student answering a question, if we can interpret this as a match between the student and the question. If the students answer correctly, that's a win for the student. If the student answer incorrectly, it's a win for the question. And yeah. Uh, this model has any, many interesting connections to current machine learning topics like logistic regression, uh, collaborative filtering in recommender systems, and so on. And also, I th and it's uh, currently used in different variations, in, not just for chess, but in, for many other sports. And I think it can be applied in many other domains, not just, for example, education systems. I can imagine, for example, using the rating system in Linux for rating uh, uh, expertise of users and difficulty of different uh, Linux commands or options of specific commands so that you can recommend to the user an appropriate command that he may be not aware of, but which will be suitable for his uh, expertise, current expertise in Linux. Another area that we focus on a lot is methodology. Methodology of evaluating machine learning techniques, specifically in our case, uh, student models, but uh, the questions that we study are relevant to many other topics. Uh, things like, if you want to evaluate some, some stuff, you need to decide how will you measure the quality of models or machine learning techniques in general, how will you set your evaluation methodology, typically training, testing set, data division, and how to deal with some biases in data. As a specific example, one common topic that's relevant to most of machine learning stuff is that when, once you build something that's able to predict something, you want to evaluate the quality. So let's say that we have uh, something like this. We are predicting binary events. In our case, it's correct, incorrect answers, but it can be also uh, something like, is there a cat in the image? Yes, no. Uh, will it rain tomorrow? Yes, no. So let's say that we are predicting these binary events, and we have a model now we do not care what the model is, but it just predicts the probability. So here the model says it's a 70% chance that it will rain. No, it didn't. Here it says it will, it's a 30% chance and it did. Now 90% chance and it did and so on. So let's say that we have this data on the, per on the performance of the model. These are the predictions and these are the observations. And we want to measure the quality of the predictions. Particularly, we often want to compare more models. So for each of the models, we have the, this list of predictions. And we want to say which one is better, because we want to use it in production, let's say. So how do we quantify the performance? We want to quantify it by a single number. So intuitively, we want somehow to take into account the distance between the predictions and the actual observations. But this can be done in many different ways. There are many different metrics for quantifying the performance. Like the, the most naive one would be the mean absolute error, where you just take the distance between the predictions and the observation, and you compute a mean value, which actually in this setting is a wrong way to do it. It has some clear disadvantages, and you should never do this, in this case of binary events. And there are many others which behave better, and each of them has some advantages and disadvantages, and it's quite hard to pick the right one. So one of our research topics was research into the, which of these measures are suitable in our particular domain of student modeling. And then uh, you often want to, th these me measures give you a single number, sim simple, single quantification, which is useful, but often you want to get a more insight into it. And 
and there are interesting ways how you can decompose the, for example, root mean square error, which is often used in many areas of machine learning. Uh, in meteorology, they call this Brier score, and they study Brier score decomposition, where you decompose the summary number in, into something called reliability, resolution, and uncertainty, which can be visualized with some helpful graphs, which can give you better insight into the behavior of your models. Then another tricky question is the division of data into training testing set. Uh, if you take the common machine learning problems like uh, classifying images, distinguishing between cats and dogs, then this is a simple issue. If you have images, you can mostly uh, split them randomly. You take 80% of your data as a training data. You train your fancy neural networks on the 80% of data, and then you use the rest 20% of data for deciding evaluating the quality of dog cat classification. But in our case, and in many other cases of machine learning, the data have some structure. Like in our case, we have data from students which are answering some question, and there are some temporal patterns which we want to respect. And dividing data randomly into training and testing set doesn't make much sense, because we would end up predicting past from the future and so on. So in our setting, it wouldn't make sense, for example, to use student level. Uh, division of data where some of the students are completing the training data and some of them are in the testing data. Uh, testing data. In some cases, we want to have item level division where some items are in the testing set and some in the tr training set and so on. And again, this is quite tricky because there are not no clear uh, correct answers. There's not a clear correct methodology. It depends on the use case and it's something that we try to evaluate and explore. Uh, and again, another trick aspect is the temporal aspect when we have sequences of answers. Uh, how do we divide these into training and testing data? And the final topic that I want to mention that we work on and I, that I think has applications beyond education is item similarity. Uh, in our case, we have in our systems, we have thousands or tens of thousands of items, questions, problems, uh, and it's quite uh, tricky to manage all this, uh, all this data. And for this, one specific thing that is useful is uh, similarity of items. So let's say I have uh, 100 programming assignments, introductory programming assignments in Python, something like uh, write a program that prints uh, uh, 100 primes or something like that. And I want to measure the quality, the similarity of two assignments. This is useful, for example, for just managing the items. Even 100 programming assignments is already quite a lot to get a sense of. And for domain modeling or for recommending pro problems to students and so on. Uh, as a specific example, here I have an illustration, a bit small, sorry, uh, of uh, item similarity of in English vocabulary. So here I have some animals, uh, months, and colors. And in all cases, uh, I have projection into space based on similarity computed in three different ways. This, this one is based on syntax, just on the, uh, on, on the letters in the words. The second one is the use of some word embeddings computed by neural networks which try to capture semantics of words, how the words are used in sentences. And the third one is based on performance data from our systems on the mistakes that students make. Each of them is slightly different. So for example, here we can see that uh, when we take into account mistakes, June and July end up close together because at least for Czech students, these are data from Czech students, uh, mistaking June and July is a very common mistake. So these are the visualization based in different ways on, on the data. The, again, the problem with studying item similarity is that we do not have any cor clear correct answer. What's the, we do not have any ground through data about the similarity of English vocabulary. Which one of these is better, it's hard to say. But nevertheless, we can study it and we can compare different methods and it's, the, it's useful. Here's the overview of the general pipeline that we use for studying the item similarity. We have some uh, Input data, for, let's t uh, take as an example the programming exercise. So if we have some programming exercise, uh, we have the item statement, something like the natural language sentence, write a program which outputs all primes uh, smaller than 1,000. Then we have uh, possibly item solutions, for example, the sample Python program which solves the problem. And then we have the performance data about the uh, performance of students. For example, how long did it take to solve the problem, uh, whether they solved it correctly, and so on. Based on this input data, we use different machine learning techniques to compute the similarities. We compute some feature matrices, item similarity matrices. We use some projections like uh, PCA and so on. And once we have the final similarities, we can use them in many different ways for visualization, which I showed you, for clustering, for recommendations, and so on. And as this diagram shows, there are many different decisions, different steps that we, we make. 
which data we will use, how will we process them, uh, which of the, uh, for example, similarity measures will we use, and so on. So what we have done is analysis of this pipeline, studying which of the steps, which of the decisions are important, and which are not that much important. And again, I wanted to highlight these topics because similarity uh, is uh, relevant in many different fields today. It's used across a variety of fields, for example, in recommender systems like when Amazon recommends you books or Netflix recommends you movies. This is often based on some notion of similarity, which is computed in different ways. In natural language processing today, the embeddings, word embeddings, are very popular and useful for many different tasks. And they also try to capture some sense of uh, similarity between words. And as I said, we study a lot of programming exercises. So for example, in the domain of programming, plagiarism detection, uh, detecting cheating by students is again based in some way of similarity of codes. So again, thinking about similarity, I think can be useful in many domains. Uh, so for, so, and it can be inspiring. For example, if I pick something close, closer to Linux, let's say Python packages, if you think about Python libraries, uh, how, what does it mean that two Python libraries are similar? How could we measure the similarity of Python libraries? If we are able to measure the similarity of Python libraries, can it this be useful for something? What can we do with such a similarity measure? So to summarize, here are the main points. I wanted to highlight that personalization of education is difficult. It's something that many people are working on today, but it's difficult and we are, have far away to go. Elevating system, originally from chess, but applicable in many domains, simple, quite powerful, I definitely recommend to have a look at it. Sim measuring similarity, it's kind of unclear because it's not clear what does it really mean. We don't have a ground to do, but nevertheless, it's quite useful for many applications. And I also wanted to highlight that machine learning is full of methodological traps. Today, many people are seduced by availability of packages like TensorFlow, which, can, which allow you to easily seemingly easily implement powerful techniques but then they end up evaluating it using some ad hoc metric without thinking whether it's a suitable metric or not, and this can lead to quite misleading and dangerous results. Okay, thank you for your attention, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. All right, questions? Hello. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what software framework do you use for machine learning? Uh, we mostly work with Python and some of the common Python libraries. Mostly, in many cases, uh, particularly I tend to implement uh, the techniques on my own because we, it's usually sufficient to use relatively simple techniques but to really understand what's going on. So, for example, in the, in the studies of, the, of different measures, what I have used basically are quite simple simulations to get inside into, into this, but it's important that I really have exact control about the computation because some, one specific issue that we, I studied was the averaging issues in computing of the root mean square error, whether we have a metrics like this, the, the value is computed average across rows or columns or something like that. If you use frameworks, often these details are hidden to you. You do not have control over them or, uh, well, often you are not aware that something like this that is happening. So I often prefer to implement the techniques on my own to really understand what's going on. But in other cases, we are, of course, using something like scikit-learn and such a common Python libraries. So we, we do not do everything on our own. Okay, so my question is regarding the uh, culture differences. And do you need to tune your models between the different countries or between the different age populations and uh, how yeah, much? Yeah, yeah. So I say, these results are based on data from Czech students and definitely if we uh, collected the data from African students it would look, look completely differently. And uh, this is definitely a, a meaningful question. Uh, we, this, this is not, not, not something that we study. Our, our data are mostly from Czech students. We do not have uh, other data. Uh, actually, for this geography application was also used by some uh, American students, a small portion of the traffic, because we, we had also English localization, so something like 5% of the traffic was for America. So uh, I had one mature student who tried to look at these differences, but the, the differences were there, but were quite weak, and we do not have a powerful data for this question, so we do not study it at the moment. But definitely in the community, that's something that is studied and that's relevant. But even for the Czech Republic, you do have the data from different uh, age of uh, students or people working with the system, right? 
Yeah, but here the difference is uh, it's like a continuum spectrum. For example, I, I had an intuition that in, we have the math practice, which is uh, used by some very young students and some older students. So I had an intuition that there should be some distinct groups of users. But all the analysis that we tried were quite fuzzy. Everything was like continuous transition from very poor students to very strong students without any clear group. So I think that for, at least for our data, we do not have very strong groups which would be worth kind of analyzing. Mm -hmm. For example, in other settings, uh, I have seen some talk for, which presented data from mathematics, basically similar software as we have, similar functionality, but their user group was uh, children with, with dyscalculia. Uh, so we have some kind of problems with learning math. And uh, here, the, the, they have different kinds of problems. So uh, in the, their, their ana analysis, they have very strong groups of students, depending on the kind of dyscalculia that they have. But in our data, I have not been able to detect any such strong groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I, I have one more. Uh, are those tools that you you showed mainly those uh, simple math and, mm -hmm. and so on? Are those available for public, or is it just for the schools that you cooperate with? Yeah, they, they are definitely available. Uh, some of them are open source, like this one was the. Uh, this one is actually developed by my PhD student, who is paid by Red Hat. So this is an open source project, which can be used by uh, anybody. Some of them are uh, like this one is developed by, by my former PhD students. And it's now so sold to, as a licensed product to schools and uh, families. Uh, even the ones that are open, like this one is open and can be used by anybody. These are used mainly by schools. We can see it from the traffic data that are, this is used mainly in the morning hours during weekdays, so it's uh, during the school days. But definitely we have, for example, in the English, uh, we have also quite strong evening traffic and uh, traffic by uh, adults. So we... Okay, thank you. Well, thank you again for your talk. Mm -hmm.